Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, English's celebration of ASU's uh, homecoming and to the 2020 Homecoming Writing Awards. I am Kevin Sandler. I'm chair of the Homecoming Committee and an associate professor in the Film and Media Studies program here in the Department of English. While uh, 2020 may not allow for a traditional ASU homecoming, uh, the Department of English Homecoming Writing Contest continues, and in this virtual event, uh, winners of this year's awards in a variety of categories, three of them, that is fiction and nonfiction, poetry, and scholarly essay will lead from their work. The Homecoming uh, Writing Awards were established 12 years ago in 2000, 13 years ago now, 2007, at the request of Randall McGraw-Helms, who is now an emeritus professor in the Department of English. The awards are funded by donors to the department's scholarship account, and we thank all of our donors for contributing to help make these awards possible. This year, the awards are given in three categories, poetry, short story, creative nonfiction, and scholarly essay, and I want to thank the judges for all their hard work in reading all the submissions and choosing the winners. And I also want to thank Bradley Irish for organizing the submission process. A few housekeeping notes, which are a little different than they are in the past. Please be aware um, that the event uh, is being recorded. And uh, lastly, we are going to turn on the chat at the end for questions and comments. Uh, you can use the participant controls to raise your hands or to give applause. If you raise your hand, we will enable you to unmute and to ask a question or to make a comment. Uh, this contest always garners the most submissions of any of our awards and scholarships, and it's difficult to choose the winner. Uh, but now let's hear from all our winners uh, and from them reading their work. So we'll begin with the award winner in, uh, in poetry. That will be uh, Brie Hoffman will be reading from the He, Him, His collection. Three. Hi, um, thank you so much for uh, this award. It means a lot. Um, I'm gonna be reading two out of the four poems that I submitted, because um, a couple of them are kind of long-winded. Um, I write a lot about um, relationships and past trauma, um, my own experiences, things like that. Uh, and so this first poem is called Saint Patriarch. His pronoun, possessive, a brain of unchecked bruises, soft with unclaimed baggage, a patron of bounced check child support and syringes, a saint of sinners bathed in Bic lighter light. Coming back down is worse than this. He hits the pipe again and sees the gold Cadillac following him to the liquor store. It's like this. You find him hiding under mom's bed early one morning because he wants to catch her fucking another man before she leaves for work. You are too small to know how the game works, so you crawl under the bed with him. Some days you smell like him, like the bottom shelf shit, the stuff he swaddles and cradles in brown paper bags. You think of this padlock without a key, unlearn this combination, try another, wait, while he locks himself in the room at the end of the hall. When his pockets are empty, it takes days and days for him to be real Christ-like, born again in the backroom crypt of a mobile home, baptized in cold sweat and thornbush. He, noun, ascendant, who believes in nothing he can't metabolize. Him, pronoun, root cause, identifier, a thing, hypothetical title, a number you stop memorizing. Saint archived in a cherry red rap sheet. The one who smashed a chair he made with his hands against the wall beside your soft, dumb skull. He made that too. He who breaks another thing he made with love, who crawled out first and left you under the bed. And then my second poem is called Poem About Inheritance. And it begins with a quote. The very emphasis of the commandment, thou shalt not kill, makes it certain that we are descended from an endlessly long chain of generations of murderers, whose love of murder was in their blood, as it is perhaps also in ours. 
Sigmund Freud. He pled not guilty before I was born, before a clot of blood was shot shrapnel into my mother's womb, when the only title he wore was a number in a system of numbers. She married him less than a year after his release in 93, sentenced to eight years, but served only six. Their little specter born almost nine months to the day after the ceremony, conceived in a Vegas hotel room, just back from the chapel, fresh off a manslaughter charge. But maybe she didn't care that he allegedly shot and killed a man shit-faced back in 87, because that's what love is, baby cakes. And this is what I know of where I come from. I am sitting in a car with my date, being choked with the seatbelt when I think of mom raped at 14 and if she thought she deserved all that came in the years after. And I think of things passed through bloodlines like cancer in grandma's lungs, the predisposition to violence that runs in dads. Does it skip a generation if I bleed it like a wound? And we regret to inform you that due to sins of the father, this strand will keep spiraling way up and up where it lands, no one knows. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. Uh, next up is the winner for scholarly essay. That is Zane Encinas, and he will be reading from On the Foucauldian Carceral State and Anzaldua's Borderlands. Zane. Hello. Obviously, thank you for this award. And so I'm going to be reading a condensed version of my essay. Um, as he said, on the Foucauldian carceral state and also do his borderlands, which, although initially written two years ago, remains just as pertinent to our current political climate as it was then. Michel Foucault's work, Biopolitics in the Carceral Society, introduces a radical structural analysis that identifies the carceral network as a surveillance biopolitical machine that redefines criminality to extend to the various contexts of social life. It actively governs how people perceive and are perceived. The archipelagic na nature of the carceral system refers to the interconnectivity of the institutions and their ability to normalize the disciplinary power in people's daily lives. These institutions draw ambiguous lines to determine normativity and through the generation of dualisms, they punish and forcefully conform those deemed as delinquent, other, and lesser. The act of line drawing, as Gloria Anzaldua writes in her work, The New Estiza, perpetuates both material and psychic violence. Her work is both a historical and personal account of the conflicts that arise in the demarcation of borders between the U.S. and Mexico and the emotional dilemma faced by individuals who find themselves excluded by dualistic social categorization. Foucault's conceived carceral archipelago broadens the, its control by normalizing extra-legal practices of mass deportations, racial profiling, and colonial expansion to Mexico, and thus sustains the universal reign of the normative. The naturalized examinatory consciousness dictates what constitutes the social deviance and forces the mestiza into an unsafe position that fluctuates between equally alienating, alienating categories of existence. Ansel Dua's feminist architecture embraces the ambiguity of the borderlands and provides an effective survival strategy in it, while simultaneously being able to combat the carceral structure on an epistemological level by liberating notions of identity from hegemonic dualisms. Ansel Dua finds that the continuum of the carceral state justifies excuse me, justifies and normalizes the United States historically extra-legal practices by designating Mexicans as the villainous threatening other. The continuity of the carceral system uniquely enables it to make the power to punish natural and legitimate and lowering at least, quote, the threshold of tolerance to penalty and it tends to face what may be exorbitant in the exercise of punishment, end quote. Its penitentiary techniques are normalized when institutions replicate, quote, the prison form, the model of, in, of justice itself, end quote, and generate new conceptions of legality. Legality is a fluid entity that the penitentiary state molds to fulfill its desires for power and wealth. Naturalization hinders the public's ability to perceive excessive punishment. And instead of it being a single noticeable display of power, there's a constant pressure that society becomes desensitized to. Individuals who occupy Anzal Dua's conceived borderlands internalize psychic violence, resulting from the carceral system's normative border production that continuously excludes and degrades the hybrid identities. Border, borders, both geographic and social, quote, distinguish us from them, end quote, Whereas the quote, borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary, it is in a constant state of transition, end quote. Affective relationships to the division of the culture and identity erects the borderlands. Representations in the borderlands are always inaccurate and oppressive. But Jesus constantly fear, quote, being unacceptable, faulty, damaged. To avoid rejection, some of us conform to the values of the culture, push the unacceptable parts into the shadows, end quote. Dualistic modes of thought entrench themselves and become dogmatized. The yearning for of a sense of belonging results in a compulsory co uh, confirmation. People suppress the parts of themselves considered abnormal to avoid stigmatization from society. There is no secure place of belonging for these individuals. The carceral state succeeds in disempowering its prisoners, and home is no longer a safe place to return. 
the carceral system transforms the subject into an extension of the archipelago, and the need for external control declines because individuals find themselves adopted or adopting a self-defeating practice. Institutions from every direction constrict and conform. There is no safe place that is void of the universal reign of the normative that acts as shackles to imprison agency. These institutions pinpoint instances of deviation that, deem, that they deem as dangerous. Their means of exercising punishment is through correction. Dominating observations shape how people understand themselves. They subject themselves to similar pressures to conform, resulting in objectification of identity. And in order to escape the intense grips of the system, people need to reclaim, reclaim their hybridity. Also, do a survival strategy that feminist architecture embraces the ambiguities and contradictions of the borderlands while providing a freeing hybrid epistemological reimagining that breaks down dualistic modes of thinking. The borderlands are spaces of both liminality and potentiality for Anzal Dua. Instead of being lost in the flux between dualisms, the Mestiza can adopt a plural and transformative consciousness. Despite its immense biopolitical capabilities and its ability to infuse every aspect of society with a carceral state, it is also not a permanent structure. A feminist architecture is able to combat the very means of control utilized. Possessing agency is a necessary prerequisite to engaging in any material abolitionist movement. You can't abolish the prison if you're locked inside of it. Thank you. Thank you, Zane. Next up is our creative nonfiction winner, Sally Kruger Wyman, who is going to be reading from again and again. Thank you very much. Um, so before I read, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to the ASU English department. Um, I transferred to ASU last January after taking a significant time off of college. Um, I have a chronic illness and for many years, I thought I would not be able to continue my education. Um, so not only has ASU allowed me this life-changing opportunity, but the English professors that I've had the chance to work with have been really incredible, uh, two of whom are here today. So I will always be grateful. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'm gonna read a portion uh, from the middle of my essay titled Again and Again. News. April 13th, California, Oregon, and Washington governors sign a Western States Pact to work together to reopen the economy. Everyone is a germaphobe these days. Every sane person is a germaphobe these days, though perhaps the line of sanity is increasingly blurred. Not my president wonders if we can inject bleach into our bodies, yet refuses to wear a mask. A friend of mine tells me she Cloroxes her husband before letting him in every night. I do a constant dance around the cloying scent of artificial citrus and cleaning product. A waft of air from the kitchen where my mother is disinfecting groceries drifts towards me. I silently retreat, holding my breath. Shafts of light illuminate footprints on the now dusty floor of my bedroom. I do not hold a candle to Hortensia, our beloved housekeeper. My overactive mast cells the source of allergies leave my skin a constant flushed red. I'm very reactive these days. Everything non-essential closes or partially shuts down. Movie theaters, amusement parks, hair salons, malls, gyms, offices. Anderson Cooper gives himself a bald spot. Unknowing husbands shower in the background of their wives' work calls. A man goes viral for the horrible haircut his loving wife gave him. Grandfathers build amusement parks for their grandchildren in their backyards. Balcony serenades become commonplace. People play tennis from separate balconies. A man in socks squirts dish soap on the kitchen floor, grabs the counter, and begins to run. People share videos of the quirky ways we humans are surviving in isolation to combat the brutal truth of a world in pandemic. John Krasinski starts Some Good News, then infuriates fans by selling it for big money. News. May 8th, Ahmed Arbery would have been 26. A video taken on February 23rd of Ahmed Arbery going for a run and being hunted and shot down by two white men, plus the man filming, circulates. Days after the video goes viral, the men are finally arrested. Sourdough is trending. Seeds are sold out across the country. Are we returning to a simpler time? My flower supplier begins to ration, one bag per type per customer. How many sourdough starters will die when the pandemic ends? A friend tells me she spends hours watching British, couple, British couples look at homes on television. 
plotting their move to the simpler, earthier country. What else are people doing to ground themselves in simplicity, to ease their troubled minds? Nature seems louder these days. I like to listen to the birds. News, May 25th. In Central Park, a white woman calls the cops on a black bird watcher who has asked her to put her dog on a leash. She tells the police, quote, there is an African-American man recording me and threatening myself and my dog. Please send the cops immediately, end quote. Mornings are difficult for me. My blood pressure doesn't adjust from the pronate sleeping position to the upright awake position until at least 11 a.m. And then sometimes it just doesn't at all. When I'm at my own home, I've worked out a system that's difficult but doable. I know where everything is ahead of time and I can go directly to the things I need. I don't have to think. I know the kitchen will be exactly as I'd left it the night before. When I am at my parents' house, it's almost like I'm blind and disoriented. Every morning I have to take stock of what has changed. I have to remember that this big kitchen is not the small kitchen I've accustomed myself to. Other people use this kitchen. Other people move stuff. Just trying to find where the eggs are in the fridge, the butter, to figure out if we have bread to toast. My brain revolts at having to ingest information with a blood flow that's too slow. I am literally like a computer crashing. All of a sudden, I just don't work. My parents make me breakfast almost every day of this pandemic. I am 27 years old. They also make me dinner and usually lunch. I am talking to my mom about Ahmet Arbery and the Central Park bird watcher, Christian Cooper, as she makes dinner. Like always, she has the news on in the background. I see a man die. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder, you can use the participant controls to raise your hands or to give an applause. If you raise your hand, we'll enable you to unmute and to make a comment to any of our winners. So I'll leave it open for a moment. So I'll start with a, a question um, uh, just for uh, to Zane. Uh, Zane, what, uh, what drew you to Foucault? Uh, certainly not an, an easy theorist. Um, um, why, uh, why did you choose him as a, uh, as a vehicle for your expression? Yeah, sure. So I had done high school debate for a while. So this was during my freshman year during a human event class, and I had uh, read a lot of Foucault's work during my time in high school debate. Um, and I thought this was a good opportunity, at least, especially because it's my first essay for my human event class, to uh, build upon things I already knew and to interact that with some of the uh, readings that we were doing and engaging with in the class, uh, like Angel Dula's work. So I think that's my main motivation. I, I saw, and I also saw both of them fitting really well together, and, and they complement the ways in which uh, some of Angel Dula's work is more. Uh, artistic than Foucault's. I think that both of them paired pretty well. Thank you. Question. All right, Krista, there you are. There I am. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. I just want to thank all of the students for reading. That Those were incredibly powerful pieces of art. <laughs> um, so thank you. And uh, um, I had a question for Sally in that I was wondering when you were reading, I know it's creative nonfiction, but it almost sounded like poetry. Do you write poetry as well? Thank you. I, I do write poetry. I don't write it as frequently as I write both nonfiction, uh, personal essays and, and fiction. Um, but my mother is actually a poet. So it's been, I've definitely been soaked in poetry my whole life. So I appreciate that you think it comes out in the, the creative nonfiction. Thank you. No, I do. I think it's very lyrical and uh, uh, the images were very vivid. It was very nicely done. Thank you. And I wanted to ask Bree. Um, well, I guess it's more of a comment, Bree. I just wanted to thank you for sharing what you shared. I could imagine that that's not easy. And uh, uh, it was very powerful. Thank you so much. That means a lot. There's a, a question for you, Bree, in the chat. Uh, what poet, living or dead, has done most to shape your own fine, controlled, poetic voice? Oh, wow. Well, um, this might be a, a bit of a cop-out answer, um, but the first poet I ever gave a crap about was um, Edgar Allan Poe. I found Annabelle Lee when I was in high school, 
And as a, as an angsty teenager, it just did something for me. I don't, I don't know what it was. Um, so I do have kind of that stereotypical poet love for Poe. And so I would probably pick him. Um, and I'm still in like a bunch of contemporary poetry classes. So I'm learning about a bunch of really talented current people, but I don't think they'd beat Poe personally. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Henry Quintero. Uh, yeah, Zane, I, I, I enjoyed your, your, your piece as well. I was wondering what drew you to, not only to Foucault, but what drew you to write about the border? Yeah, sure. So Anzal Dua's work um, is obviously related to the borderlands and her experience. Um, occupying multiple identities, both being Mexican, also being American, and also other aspects of our identity that occupy this place of the borderland. So, as I mentioned, the essay is not necessarily specifically related to geographic borders, but can also relate to social borders that exist. And I think a lot of Foucault's work draws upon this idea of um, ambiguous lines drawn or demarcating different identities that aren't necessarily needed to be demarcated in order to suppress one side of that uh, dichotomy. And I think that the border at least materially also signifies a, a, a place for us to see how that occurs. And uh, I think that also occurs in places like Yuma and areas near the border where we can see, even though it's not necessarily right next to the border wall, there is this type of separation that occurs in um, everyday experiences for a lot of people. So did you read Gloria when you were in high school as well? Yeah, I did. Yeah, she's amazing. You reminded me, your, your voice reminded me of Edward Spicer. So I really enjoyed your your, your commentary, so thank you. I appreciate it, thank you. This is a question um, uh, for everyone. Um, um, how has, you know, this time in, during this pandemic and the time during, you know, quarantine, uh, you know, for, for many people in many different ways, how has that um, shaped, you know, how you've written, what you've written, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to perhaps, you know, a year ago? I don't know if I um, really had ever considered writing about like contemporary things. Um, I think um, like some poets do it very well, but I think a lot of times with uh, poetry, you're kind of writing about something that happened already. Um, and so I found this year writing became a challenge because it was less, um, less talking about things from like a distant uh, memory perspective and more about writing about things I was experiencing every day. And I know that's not revolutionary, but I had never really encountered that uh, in terms of my own writing. And so I kind of feel like my style changed more to writing about things that had happened to me um, versus things that were ongoing in my life and in the world. I'll jump in there and answer as well. Um, so I mentioned I have a chronic illness and also that I, I started school at ASU online in January which was just a few months before the pandemic started. So definitely my life really changed a lot in the last years. So I know that changed my, my writing in many ways. But one thing about the pandemic that I think is really unusual is that it is something that everyone across the world is experiencing together. So it's a common experience that, you know, it, we, as humans, we all have things that, we, we, that are common experiences but this is one of those rare, extremely life-changing things that, that does bring us together in a way, even though it has us each separated in our homes. So I think my, um, my writing has been affected in, in thinking of the world that way and also in hoping that my experience as a disabled person, person who has to think constantly about her health is also um, a consideration that the rest of the world is for better or worse, having to think about as well. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I guess I can hop into you really quickly as well. Um, I think that what I write about now has changed significantly. I know as a freshman and sophomore, so two years before COVID, I was really focused on scholarly writing and I did a lot of work with uh, law professors and legal writing. And I realized after the pandemic that I was very detached myself in a lot of ways. So although some of my creative energy was being placed into those writings, it was oftentimes detached from my own experiences. So um, I found myself experimenting more with different types of writing that is a little bit more personal. And although this essay didn't necessarily reflect that, I think that uh, the pandemic has certainly uh, created some type of transition in what I value in my writing. We have a question from Bradley Reiner. Originally, when I uh, signaled a hand in chat, I thought that my question would be directed at um, 
Brie and Sally, but with uh, Zane bringing up uh, the personal, I think I'm addressing to all of our presenters. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot um, during the pandemic, during distancing is, you know, the relationship between very individual experiences and collective experiences and the difficulty of communicating one's individual experience, even in the context of a sort of shared collective moment. Uh, and, you know, certainly with um, your, your work, Sally and Brie, you know, I really felt that individual expression in uh, sort of moving ways. I wondered if each of you could talk to uh, the sort of challenges uh, or the way you think about the craft of communicating something very personal to an audience who has not experienced that same uh, personal event. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, writing about, uh, writing a personal essay, you innately share your personal life and it, it can be a challenge to figure out what to share. Um, personally, you know, I often in all types of my writing end up thinking about, and I'm afraid I can't remember who this quote is from, but um, I think it's that the, the, the more, that the specific is universal or that the unique is universal. So one thing that I try to do is really look at my life honestly and think about what, what details are important to me and what, even if it's, even if it's something that can sort of seem commonplace because it's something, it's, it's a daily routine or something, but try to, I try to look at what, what makes me me and what makes my experience my own, even if it can seem um, perhaps boring. The fact that it is something that, that I do and that is specific to my life, I try to make more interesting <laughs> by going into really honest details. Um, so, thank you. Yeah, um, I think for poetry, um, poetry is like one of the most vulnerable forms of expression in my experience. Um, and I think the value that it has as like a tool of communication comes from the fact that like, the poems that I read do not have to be universal experiences for there to be some common emotion taken from it. Um, so, you know, like I, I write about the relationship with my father. Um, I didn't have a very good relationship with my father and that doesn't necessarily mean the reader has to also have that same um, poor relationship with their father, but I'm sure that they've been let down by a parent as a child at some point. Like, I think that, um, for me, like the important element of like writing and like the craft of it is just trying to find a way to convey a feeling that someone can resonate with or connect to in some way that then goes on to become more personal to them. So it takes on a meaning outside of the poetry itself. Thank you so much. Can, can each of you talk about um, what uh, you're currently working on? Yes. Yeah, I can start. Um, so some of the things that I'm working on, because so as some background, I'm majoring in philosophy, English, and sustainability. So a lot of my work hops across the disciplines at different times, and oftentimes my research or internships really dictate what I do. And one form of writing that I've found really rewarding recently is working with youth in the Durango Juvenile Detention Center, and we're writing uh, basically a trauma-informed uh, substance abuse curriculum for them in a way that's engaging and interactive. And also you have to take in consideration that you're giving them like basically a laptop or an iPad to read these things off of. We still want to communicate that uh, emotion and that care for these people who are obviously stuck in uh, the detention center at such a horrible time, despite any other situations, especially with COVID and being quarantined. So I think that that type of work is something that I found really valuable recently. Recently. Okay, I'll share what I'm working on. Um, I'm actually in a fiction writing class right now with Professor Cruiser, who's here attending. Um, so we had a deadline today, so I just mm -hmm. submitted a short story um, where I, uh, so I guess I'm, I'm working on uh, in some sort, some, <laughs> some short stories, uh, as well as 
poetry occasionally. And overall, I'd, I'd like to be able to, um, to find a way to frame a, a personal narrative of my life with chronic illness. So I'm working on um, figuring that out. I, um, I've been dealing with illness for a very long time. So I would like to be able to um, put it together in a creative nonfiction um, longer story. Um, I am finishing up uh, an advanced poetry course for the semester um, and getting ready to go into Capstone. Um, I've also uh, signed up for the um, training class for the Superstition Review because I'm hoping to learn more about um, publishing and advertising and sort of getting like a good feel for just the the um, the field itself because I feel like that can do nothing but help um, going into sort of like the writing world. Um, but the thing about poetry is like, you just have to keep writing them. And then one day, hopefully you can uh, gather a bunch of them and see if anyone wants it, wants anyone. Just handing out free poems to see if someone will pay me for them one day. But um, yeah, I'm just sort of finishing up my time here at ASU and um, trying to write as much as I can while I have the time to do it. And we have a uh, another question from the chair of our department, Krista Ratcliffe. Thanks, Kevin. Um, my field's rhetoric and composition, so I'm really interested in people's writing processes. And I say a plural because I don't think we each have one. I think we adjust it to different things. But I was curious about uh, each of the three of you. Could you talk a little bit about what is important to your writing processes? Well, I've been thinking about that a lot lately because I do feel like I need to work on my writing routine. Um, with my health, my energy levels are very, um, they, they fluctuate quite a bit. So it's been difficult for me to create like a set time when I like to sit down. Um, but one thing that I've realized is that while the time sitting down at my computer writing is very important because there's that common phrase to be a writer, you have to write. But I spend a lot of my time away from the computer, like my quiet time, sort of thinking about what I want to write, what is important to me right now, digesting my life, the world, just whatever I'm going through. And that is almost more important um, in my writing process than the time I actually sit down and write. So I find it's really important to, to give myself time in my routine, whether it's taking a walk, whether it's just, whether it's meditating, being in the garden to, to have those quiet moments when I can sort of digest the world in my life. Um, my process is, um... I wouldn't call it remarkable, really. Um, uh, it's tricky because like when you're in a class that demands you write poetry, it, it's it's kind of less about writing when you feel like it. And you, sometimes you have to write on a schedule. Um, but I always start with uh, writing on paper first. I find that I, I just feel like there's more of a, um, more of like an intimate connection between what's going on in my head um, and my hand. I feel like I can get it out quicker or just scribble things out. Um, I also keep uh, like a notepad on my phone um, and if it's like a TV show or a movie and they'll say like a phrase that I think is really interesting, I write it in like a, a note app on my phone. Things like corrugated metal or death bloom, <laughs> just words that I think have like a fun sound to them, a really cool poetic sound. And then down the line, if I'm ever sort of stuck for a good um, word, sometimes one of the things I wrote down will sort of like trigger some inspiration for the thing that I'm writing. Um, but it really just kind of varies on the subject matter I'm writing about. If it's like a more emotional poem uh, is a little different from how I might write like a, like a love poem, for instance. So it kind of varies, but those are the things that are always pretty much unchanged. Yeah, and for me, I think one process that always stays the same is I approach a lot of my writing from like as an academic or researcher where I'll read extensively into existing literature to find certain gaps that I think are interesting. And I also think that provides a good opportunity to uh, get a good understanding of how literature is to talk about certain issues and figure out the ways in which they interact with each other. So I think it's definitely a, a iterative process through uh, different essays writing that I've written or other types of writing that I've written. So I think that's something that has been really valuable. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Any additional questions? Uh, if not, I want to thank all of you for sharing your reading with us. 
uh, I want to, and if I can speak for all the participants of congratulating you once again for being the 2020 Homecoming uh, Award winners uh, in all of your various categories. So thank you everybody for attending and uh, have a wonderful evening.